Good morning, everyone. It's Kevin here from Skywatcher, and we're doing another What's Up webcast. And uh, if you've never joined us with a What's Up webcast, we do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, it's an hour long, and we check out pretty much anything we feel like checking out, but it's all astronomy related, whether it's telescopes or observing techniques or accessories or, you know, pretty much whatever. Um, we're taking a look at that. So, each week we do a different topic and if you don't have a chance to join us live on Friday you can always watch these as they are recorded and saved onto our YouTube account at Skywatcher USA um, on our YouTube channel um, so you can go back watch any episode that you want and each week we try to cover a different specific topic uh, so that way if you're interested in learning about something about astronomy or equipment um, we try to focus each topic on something specific. Um, so this week, we're doing understanding refractors. Um, this might be review if you're new, um, if you're uh, experienced with telescopes. Um, but, you know, for beginners or people who maybe don't know as much about uh, telescopes, um, particularly the refractor design, that's what we're going to be covering today. Now, if you have any questions, uh, if you could save them towards the end, I'll do a Q&A at the end and you can answer anything you want. Um, and then, you know, throughout, we'll try to get as much of this covered as possible. So uh, let's get started. So there's obviously all different kinds of telescope designs that you can pick from. And, you know, there's refractors, there's Newtonians, there's Cassegrains. Um, so many different choices and if you ever want to kind of go over the majority of those you can go back to our telescope 101 video that kind of goes over all of those um, this one we're sticking just to refractors and I myself I like any telescope I can get a hold of but refractors are always kind of fun um, a couple years ago uh, when we were about to release our 150 ED doublet uh, some friends of mine got together and we did a shootout um, with a couple different refractors uh, just to see how they were going to work next to each other. It was kind of an interesting experiment. If you ever get a chance to do that, get a bunch of different uh, telescope samples together, run them all at the same magnification on the same target, you can start to see how uh, the subtle differences between each of those telescopes. It's kind of an eye-opening experience. Um, and if anybody wants to know this lineup real quick, this is the Skywatcher Esprit 150 triplet. This is the Celestron C6R Acromat. This is the Skywatcher EvoStar 150ED. And this, I don't have this scope anymore, but this was a old Mead um, 178ED doublet. That's a seven inch uh, ED doublet. Um, I'm almost six feet uh, tall. So that gives you kind of an idea of how big that refractor actually is. So. Um, but what we did is we got together, some friends of mine, we threw these all on the planets and the moon, all the same magnifications. You could go right down the line and you could see the differences between each one. And it was really interesting to actually see. Um, so yeah, if you have a chance, give it a try. You can learn a lot from that uh, kind of a shootout experience, especially if you've got friends who all have different samples of stuff, you can give it a shot. So first off, if you're new to telescopes, what is a refractor? Uh, well, a refractor, when you actually think of a telescope, is a telescope that basically uses a lens in the front and focuses light to a point. And within the world of refractors, there are different designs. And that's what we're going to go kind of take a look at today because each one of those designs offers different advantages um, for different applications in astronomy. Now, if you again if you are new to refractors it's probably best to understand the different uh, components that you're going to have on your telescope because if you're ever asking someone for assistance like us at Skywatcher at tech support or say you're working with a telescope shop and you need some assistance or looking for accessories it's best to know what is the, what parts are the telescope so just a quick rundown here real quick. You have the objective lens in the front. Uh, this is in a metal cell that holds the lens assembly. 
Uh, generally on today's uh, telescopes you're going to find a dovetail which allows you to mount the telescope to any particular mount and dismount it easily. You've got your mounting rings which pretty much every refractor needs. You have your finder scope and your focuser. And that's uh, pretty much the main portions of a refracting telescope. Of course you have the diagonal back here this is a little mirror that inserts into the back that bends light and reflects it up into your eye that's more for comfortable for viewing and then you have the dew shield up front here which basically uh shades the lens from any glare or dew or mist that might be in the sky uh, so that is your general layout for a refracting telescope tube and it's always good. I always try to recommend people learn the layout of your telescope. So if you need help and you call someone who might know the answer for your question, you don't want to call them up and be like, the doohickey doesn't work. Okay, I can find uh, many things I could call a doohickey, especially on a telescope. So take five minutes if you're new. Uh, just kind of learn the basic terminology of your telescope. And it makes it so much easier when you need assistance or you're learning the fundamentals of your telescope if you know what certain things are called because terminology is important. So that's for any telescope, mind you. So what's a refractor? Lenses used to focus light to a point. Um, sorry, my big head is once again in the way. Scoot myself over to the opposite corner. There we go. Uh, so refractors use lenses to bend light to a focus point. That's how it creates the image. Um, it's one of the most common designs. When most people think of a telescope, they think of a lens, and that's exactly what a refractor is. Now, refractors do come in some common sizes. Most beginner, the really, really cheap stuff um, is tiny. You're talking 40 to 60 millimeters. Ugh. Um, but we, if you're looking for a serious refractor, um, if you're new and looking for a serious refractor, I would recommend something that's at least 80 millimeters or three inches in diameter or bigger. Um, it, you have enough light with 80 millimeter to where the planets and the moon become interesting. You can get some of the brighter deep sky objects. There's a lot you can do with an 80 millimeter refractor. And if that costs you a little bit more money, um, I can tell you it's it's a little it's better to save a little bit more and get the slightly higher quality one than to chimp out and go with the cheapest cheap thing when you're starting. Um, if you go super cheap, you're gonna get irritated. You're not gonna have fun because it's flimsy and it's kind of like a toy, and it you're just not gonna have a good time out there. You, I'm sure you will. I started with a cheap little 50 millimeter refractor, but I find having done a lot of tech support and doing a lot of outreach programs, I find a lot of people get frustrated if you go with the really, really cheap stuff. Um, so just save a little bit more. If you can get something that's like 150, 200 bucks, then you're getting up in quality. And for refractors, that kind of can get difficult, but anyway. Um, so if you're looking for a refractor, try to get something that's at least 80 millimeters if you're starting out. I do understand there are high-end versions of refractors that are in the 50 millimeter range. Uh, there's our Evo Star 72 back here. This is a 72 millimeter refractor. It, it gets a little different because at this point, when you're spending 400 bucks on a 72 millimeter telescope, you're doing it for a particular reason. So most common sizes refer... Uh, yeah. Most common sizes for refractors are generally 50 millimeter to 150 millimeter or six inch. Uh, now they do make larger telescopes. Uh, six inch is probably the most user friendly large aperture telescope, um, but they do make bigger ones. You can get seven inch and eight inch models and 10 inch models. And you can also sell your car and your house and your firstborn because that's how much it's gonna take to buy one. Um, when you're getting up to refractors of that size, you're going to need an observatory unless you're really dedicated uh, lugging out something that big. Um, they are vastly, vastly superior. Um, if you ever get to take a look at it, they're incredible instruments. But 
they're expensive. It's difficult to make a telescope or a refracting telescope that big. Um, reason being is when you have a lens, I'm gonna make myself bigger for this actually. When you have a lens, this is an objective lens. This is from our EvoStar 120 ED uh, model. This is the actual lens. Um, when you have a refracting lens, it's supported from the outside of the lens assembly. A cell holds it. Well, glass can warp if you do not have it supported correctly. And, you know, when you're getting up to telescopes up to six inch, like a refractor, we can easily make lens cells to support the glass. Um, as you get bigger, that becomes more difficult, maintaining the alignment of those lenses. When you're talking an eight inch refractor, you're talking, and they're probably a triplet design, we'll get in there in a minute, there's three elements in there. There's two right here, but there's generally a third in a telescope that big. You're talking three eight inch diameter lenses, which are quite heavy, all having to be supported. Uh, so when you get really big refractors, stuff starts to warp and flex and do all this stuff that's going to affect the image. Um, so refractors aren't generally used um, to very large apertures. Um, the largest one is uh, the 40 inch or the one meter refractor, um, very famous telescope, but that is the largest refractor in the world is a, a 40 inch. Moving on. Now, refractor types, like I just mentioned ago, I mentioned a couple designs. There's a couple different um, arrangements or designs that refra uh, can't talk this uh, that refractors are are designed around. So, first one is the achromatic refractor. Then we have the apochromatic refractor, and inside of the apochromatic, there are various designs. There's the ED doublet, ED triplet. And then we have multi-element um, designs. And I'm gonna break all these down into segments here in a second so it's easier to show what the heck all that actually means. So let's start with bare bone basics, the Acromat refractor. Now an Acromat refractor is made up of two lenses most of the time, is two lenses. You have your front element and the rear element and that is focusing the colors of light to the focus point. Now, what you might notice from this diagram is the red and the green are focused pretty well, but the blue is a little offset. We're gonna talk about that in a minute because that is actually called chromatic aberration. And we're gonna talk about what that is here in a second. So, achromatic refractors. They're generally composed of two elements, like we just said. There's no exotic glass used. So when we talk about refractors, especially when we get into the high-end APO refractors, we're using specialized glass, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, they do suffer from chromatic aberration, which means not all the colors are focused to the same position. These are good for visual work and generally are fairly affordable, and they're good for beginners because you're getting that nice, sharp image that refractors are known for. Um, because a refractor uses a lens, there's no obstructions. Like if you look at a Dobsonian or a Cassegrain, they have a center mirror in the middle of it. Um, that's an obstruction. That's obstructing light and scattering light around. Um, it's not the end of the world. They're very effective telescopes. But when you'd see people online, they're like, this has a refractor-like image. Um, obviously, refractors have set a precedent of providing very high contrast, very sharp images because there is nothing obstructing the view. It's unobstructed, um, giving you a very nice, clean image. Um, but that does come at limitations of aperture. Um, so achromats, again, are composed of two elements. There's two pieces of glass that make up the lens. We don't use any crazy glass in there. Um, they do suffer from chromatic aberration, which we'll show you in a minute. Um, and they are very good for visual work, um, and they're generally what you're going to be using if you're a beginner, unless you're going to jump into something higher end. So what the heck is chromatic aberration, you might ask? Uh, this is chromatic aberration. Uh, this is a very nice image, but uh, what you can see is there's blue fringing around the brighter stars. And this isn't even super severe, this is just the best example that I had. Um, 
chromatic aberration comes from when light does not all the colors of the light do not focus to the same point something like this so with an acromat um, when you're bending or refracting light um, it's not bending all the all the wavelengths of light at the same point so what you're getting when you're looking at an image like this is that the red and the green are probably focusing pretty close to each other but the blue is actually out of focus so that's why you're seeing this halo effect that's actually out of focus light and it just happens to be in the blue so there are ways to correct for that and we're going to discuss that here in a minute um, but that's one of the uh, shortcomings of an achromatic refractor um, now usually the way you would correct for something like this is using more glass or exotic lenses but the downfall of that is is it becomes more expensive per the size of the telescope so a four inch achromatic refractor might cost you four hundred dollars where a four inch apochromatic depending on how exotic the design is could range somewhere between thousand dollars to three thousand dollars depending on how crazy we're talking about and what the design is so um, but the easiest way to address chromatic aberration is the focal length so down here at the bottom you can see shorter focal length um, is going to yield more color fringing so if you have some of these like short tube acromat refractors like skywatcher makes like a short tube 120 it's like 600 millimeter it's like an f5 um, 120 millimeter aperture I think we make a 102 as well they're fairly fast acromats and they do a nice job if you're doing low power viewing of the night sky the Milky Way you know you're panning through star fields that's really what they're designed for but if you were to put that on the moon or up the magnification and put it on something bright um, like the planets it's gonna show you a lot of color fringing because it's the shorter that scope is the more extreme the curve and the focus points have to be so the the chromatic aberration is going to be more severe on a shorter focal length instrument so to correct for something like that when you're designing a telescope uh, particularly an acromat you can actually increase the focal length and that helps the color correction a little bit more the focusing isn't uh, as uh, critical uh, your depth of field is larger so it's easier to get a more corrected image by getting those colors to all focus together so um, you'll see some of the larger acromats that are on the market are around f8 i know there are some f6.5 acromat refractors out there which are great telescopes but you want to keep in mind that when you're using a fast acromat refractor they're generally intended for deep sky viewing, wide, high contrast deep sky viewing, because you're getting that rich detail, that high contrast that refractors are known for, but you're not pushing the lens in high magnification. Um, so it doesn't matter if there's color fringing when you're using low power, because you're not getting much, uh, you're not pulling much of that out. When you increase the magnification, you're gonna see it more. So this is one of those things where you just have to kind of understand uh, what these telescopes are designed for in particular um, so you know at Skywatcher we we make a wide variety of acromats we don't sell a lot of them here in the US at the moment um, but ones that we do sell we do have the AZ GTE Star Travel 80 this would be a short tube refractor um, it's really small it's compact which is great for traveling but if you were to put this on the moon and put some magnification on there, you're gonna get the color fringing. Um, it's just part of it. Now, the nice thing about that whole package is it's probably about 400 bucks. You get a go-to mount and you get a, a little tiny three inch telescope that's gonna give you nice sharp images. And that's the whole package. Now, if we made an 80 millimeter that's much higher end, we couldn't do it at that price point. So it's all about, it's a balance of quality and, um, what you're getting out of it as well of course we also like I said we make a short tube 120 um, it's a 120 millimeter almost 5 inch refractor it's f5 so it's very short for its size um, nice 
compact gives you nice rich detail if you're really into like dark nebulas and like the um, and wide field targets it's a great telescope gives you that rich detail um, but again if you were to magnify on the moon more it'll give you a nice looking image but you're going to get this purple fringing everywhere and you can get filters to mitigate that but they're going to offset the color a little bit so now one of my favorites on the market is the Celestron Advanced VX C6R. I've owned two of these. Um, the C6R is a six inch F8 Acromat refractor. And I think you can get the whole setup for like a little, I think I looked yesterday, it was like 1500 bucks. That's a six inch refractor. That's a serious telescope. Um, I've had one of the best views of Mars I've ever seen through this telescope. And yes, there was color fringing, but you're talking about a six inch diameter lens, really rich in contrast, very nice detail. Um, it does have chromatic aberration on higher magnified images, but because of that longer focal length, it's able to help correct that a bit and you can use filters. But that setup, the C6R, if you're looking for a whole bang for buck, a big refractor experience for not a ton of money, you really can't beat the C6R. It's, they've had it forever. Um, it's a beautiful telescope. And you're getting a mount and the telescope all together, which is really cool. Cause if you wanted to get an APO version of that, it would cost more than the whole setup combined. So, but that's really an awesome setup for, you know, the money. And it gives you that big, big refractor experience. That's, that's what gets a lot of people hooked when you step up to that four, five, six inch um, refractor uh, level, you're gonna get a taste of what a big refractor can do. It's addicting. Uh, the next step up above the acromats is of course the ED doublet refractors. And there's not a ton of these on the market nowadays. Um, and we'll get into why. So an ED doublet, this is our uh, ED120. We do not tape the side in the cell we use the tape when we pull that out of the cell just to keep the lenses together when we clean them um, but this is what the an ed doublet it's just like an acromat it's a doublet a lens assembly but what's different is that the rear element is made up of an exotic glass element now uh, like i said their ed doublets are composed of two elements um, but one of the elements in the lens assembly now is used using an exotic glass. And what I mean by exotic is extra low dispersion glass. This is a glass that's usually much denser um, and it has properties inside the, the glass that actually help color correct the image and uh, adjust that uh, chromatic aberration. Um, it's not perfect, but it's uh, leaps and bounds better than some of the acromats that are out there, but that does come at a cost. Um, and there are different glasses out there. We're not going to get into the whole what glass are we using uh, because there's many different ways um, to design a telescope. It has to do with the, the matching of the two types of glass together is what gives you the color correction that you're looking for. Um, you can't just swap two pieces together and have them work um, you need to make sure they're matched up together in order to provide the correction you're looking for um, now with ED doublets it's very similar to how an acromat works to get in uh, that color correction is they're generally going to be longer focal length um, the ED element in the lens is going to help that color correction but you can actually improve it further if the if the focal length is longer um, so it's kind of a, it's got to go in two. Um, the nice thing about ED doublets is they're excellent for visual work. You're getting that really nice color corrected image now. You're starting to experience what it's like to have an apochromatic refractor. Um, and you can start dabbling with astrophotography on these uh, telescopes because of the improved color correction. So just to give you an idea, here is an ED doublet. Um, you can see that the blue is improved. We've, it's close to the focus point. And the longer the focal length of that refractor, the better that correction is gonna be. Um, we can shorten them a little bit 
to get that improved color correction. So like an 80 millimeter refractor and an Acromat is generally gonna be like F11 to get really nice color correction. Where like an 80 doublet, you can get to F7.5. Um, and what's nice about that is it's much shorter, it's lighter weight, you can use it on a variety of different mounts, it's easier to transport. So there's all kinds of improvements that come with using something like this. Um, now they're not as perfect as they could be. It is a doublet. There is limitations of what you can expect from a doublet, but they still can be uh, very nice uh, to use. And we get a lot of questions, of course, you know, can you do imaging with ED doublets? Um, I find online there's a bunch of people that like to talk down it's only a doublet. Um, yeah, that's the case. It's not a big exotic high-end refractor um so it's but it, it gets you started and you can produce some really nice images with an ed doublet here's a an image from our evo star 70 or i'm sorry this is our new evo lux 82 these are coming out hopefully later this year um this is a test image through one of those um another test image um from an 82 millimeter doublet. Uh, of course, uh, there's our Evo Guide 50, our tiny little 50, which I've got just out of reach. This little thing, our little Evo Guide 50 shot this image on the screen. So that's, you know, pretty cool. Um, but I started doing imaging when I a couple of years ago um, with an Evo Star 80, this was my first horse head shot with the Evo Star, um, and that's an 80 millimeter doublet. So you can take some nice stuff using an Evo Star or a doublet. And there's a variety. I don't want to just keep promoting the Skywatcher stuff. It is our webcast, but there's plenty of great manufacturers that are making ED doublets. Um, they're just not as abundant. Um, for So we make our Evo Star series. That's our ED doublets. Um, we make the smallest one is, actually the smallest one is our 50, which I just showed you. That's the Evo guide. But if you put the field flatteners on it, you can actually use it for imaging. Um, but then there's, of course, our 72, which you can see back here. We make an 80, uh, 100, 120, and two variations of our 150. Um, and we'll see if we do anything bigger in the future, but um, that's one set of ED doublet refractors on the market. Of And then of course, there's a variety of other ones. Uh, I know AstroTech makes some ED doublets. Um, they're, they are coming to be more popular um, because they're a good visual telescope without having to go to extremes of buying something like a triplet, which we'll get into in a second. And then, of course, if you're looking for world class, you have the Takahashi FC and FS series. Um, I think right now the FC is what they're making. I think it's like the FC 100. Um, Takahashi uses fluorite lens. Uh, um, fluorite crystal, actually, is their correcting element, which um, is the best color correcting uh, material at the moment you can use is fluorite crystal. The problem with fluorite is it's extremely brittle and difficult to work with. So you need to know exactly what you're doing and you have to grow it. So you actually have to grow your your material. So it, it can be difficult to do that. So there's the FC and the FS series. Um, these, is a, these are my friend Daniel Moundsy's scopes. Um, the one in the front is an FS 102. Um, and then the big one in the front here is the FS-152, which is probably one of the most legendary doublets ever produced. Um, if you ever have a chance to look through one of them, they're beautiful, they're big, um, but they're beautiful telescopes. Um, but that's one of the, probably considered one of the best ED doublets ever produced. Uh, they don't make the 152 anymore. I think the biggest they make right now is the, the FC-100 in the doublet format. Um, that's something to check out. Um, another company that we're all aware of, of course, is Teleview. Um, their doublets, I forgot to throw the 60 in here, but the Teleview 60, 
76 and the 85 those are all uh, ed doublet refractors as well and then there's a variety of other manufacturers starting to make doublets now as well so um sorry if i excluded anybody these are just you know off the top of my head uh cameron why is the green focus outside of red um i'm just using diagrams um you they're not to actual truth um uh, the blue is really what we're looking at but um, as far as the way I have the colors arranged, you can kind of just ignore it. So. Okay, so the next one we're talking about, and this is the one you hear about probably the most, is the ED triplet refractor. Why do we call it a triplet? Well, it uses three pieces of glass. Yep, it's took all the sexiness out of that, didn't I? So, a doublet, yep, two pieces of glass, triplet, three pieces of glass. Woo. Um, so, uh, composed of three elements. Uh, it generally uses one or more ED elements. Um, normally, most triplet refractors will have two uh, more common glasses for the outside elements, and the center element will be the ED element. Um, something like the Takahashi TOA series, like the 130 and the 150s, they actually use two ED elements. Um, I'm sure that's helpful in certain uh, applications. Um, it makes it majorly expensive, um, but I'm sure there is some advantages that do come from that. Uh, but uh, most of the time it's one ED element. If you design the telescope, um, generally you can get away with one ED element. It works just fine. Um, but adding a second one for certain applications uh, can be useful. Uh, for certain things um, again we use uh, same ED elements that would be used in the doublet you're now adding the triplet the third lens in there um, adding extra glass can always improve color correction um, but you have to remember every time you put a, an element in there the light has to go through that so it does affect your light throughput slowly um, I wouldn't take this to where it's uh, the triplet i'm losing light um it's not that big of a deal um especially with today's coatings and stuff like that makes the light throughput really good but if the more glass you actually put into a system you do lose a fraction of light as you go through each element so it's just physics so the nice thing, however, about a triplet design is that we can get away with shorter focal lengths. You can get wider fields of view. You can get away with more exotic uh, high-speed systems um, with a triplet. So there are advantages uh, going with a triplet design. Uh, they are excellent for visual. You're getting the best color correction you can out of a refractor. And they're, they're really kind of a staple for astrophotography. Uh, you talk to a lot of people are generally when they get into photography, they want to use a triplet. Um, here's one of mine. This is my Esprit 100. Uh, this, what were we testing on this? This is the Esprit 100 with the Starlight Express XSX56-16803 camera and seven position filter wheel. It's a big freaking camera. So, uh, advantages of some of the triplets on the market is they're designed to handle some of these really big sensors that are out there so um you will get into that actually next week we're talking about imaging trains so we'll, we'll talk about all of that so but so why triplets and why imaging because it seems to be a really easy default um for people to flip to a, a refractor um, and a lot of these points I'm going to make actually do apply to most refractors. Um, I just put them in here because triplets are generally what most people default to when they want to get into astrophotography. Uh, Jeff, is there any light loss between doublet versus triplet? I'm sure there is, but it's probably very small. And you'd really have to have it on a test bench with a very sensitive sensor uh, to measure it. So physically, yes. Noticeably, no. Um, especially if they're really done right pretty much everything on the market that's available now I think you'd be hard pressed to really know so. uh, triplets and imaging now like I said some of these are going to apply to most refractors 
So the nice thing about refractors are particularly like if you're getting into imaging, you're probably looking at something like an 80, 100, 120, something in there. Um, they're generally small and relatively compact. Um, so they're easy to tote around. Um, the triplet lens does allow for faster focal lengths while still giving you that uh, color correction that we want. Nice thing about refractors is no collimation is required. You shouldn't really have to touch your refractor once it's adjusted. Uh, most companies will have adjustments on there. Don't mess with it. Um, but they are there to make adjustments if needed. Um, but most of the time you probably will not have to touch your refractor. Um, and if you don't know what you're doing, oh, do not touch. Do not put your hand in the cookie jar. Um, just leave it alone. If the images look great, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, nice thing about refractors, because the cameras are on the back side of the telescope, um, is you can use a wide range of different camera and sensor sizes, uh, depending on the, the corrector that's being used. Again, next week's topic, we're talking about imaging trains, and we'll talk about all of that. Um, and they're excellent color correction because they're using that triplet objective. They're having a higher amount of correction. So you can get away with like our Esprit 100, for example, is an f5.5 four-inch refractor. That's really fast. If we made an Acromat in that size, you'd have color for days. It'd look like you spilt out a bag of Skittles. Um, but, or a kaleidoscope, um, if you like candy, there you go. Uh, but because it's a triplet, it has improved color correction. We can make it nice and short and compact, and it's going to give you that really nice, uh, color correction. Now above the triplets, uh, we get into multi-element designs and there's a variety of them, but one of the most basic ones does something like this, where you've got a doublet in the front and you've got a doublet in the back. Um, and the rear doublet assembly is generally there for uh, flattening the field. Um, so it gives you a nice pinpoint images across the field. Uh, most refractors when you're imaging need to use a corrective element called a field flattener. Um, because, because the lenses are curved, they're focusing light at slightly different positions and to a flat sensor. So a field flattener is gonna correct for that. Again, we're talking about ne ne next week. But to get around that, if you want everything internal, you can use multi-element designs like the doublet or the, the quad is what you're seeing here. We're using two sets of uh, uh, lens assemblies and that can put everything internal uh, depending on the design. Uh, like the Takahashi FSQs, um, they have that internally. So it's, it's really designed for imaging. Generally, this can be overkill for visual, but it just depends on what the design is for. Uh, this is commonly referred to as a Petzival design, um, and they can be more complex, and but they can house generally larger sensors um, without the addition of additional optics. Um, they do exist out there. Probably one of the, like I said earlier, one of the most well known is the Takahashi FSQ series. That's the FSQ 85, 106, and they did make a 130. They just discontinued it, probably because it cost 12 grand, but um, these are specialized instruments at this point. They're, they're really nice um, though. Um, but they're designed for imaging, imaging with big sensors um, without additional optics being needed. Um, so these are astrographs at this point. Um, you could use them for visual, but you'd be spending a lot of money for not gaining really anything. Um, but if you're doing imaging, some of these telescopes are definitely high on the consideration. Um, Teleview also makes some very nice uh, Petzivals. They have the NP101IS and the NP127IS. Uh, they actually, the NP101 is still a Petzival as well, but that was discontinued in favor of the IS, which has been adjusted to have larger uh, lens assemblies in the back for improved uh, illumination of bigger sensors. So. Uh, that's another set of Petzivals. Um, there's some other ones on the market too, um, some more mass produced ones that are coming out a lot. Um, I can't think of them. Like Astrotech had the Astrotech 65, um, which is a, a tiny little Petzival. Um, 
cute little scope. I don't think they make it anymore though, but um, stuff like that. You can check it out. You'll hear them, they'll be called quads or um, they can even get really exotic like sextuplets. Um, and then you're just adding more and more uh, to it, but that can be beneficial if you're using large imaging sensors. So just to recoup really quick, refractors, um, advantages of refractors, um, they can be compact in size. They can be low maintenance because you don't need to collimate them uh, regularly. Uh, fairly straightforward, you know, just point it up, put an eyepiece in it and go to work. Um, optically, they can produce high contrast images because you don't have that sec uh, central obstruction in the middle of the lens there. Um, that gives you that really nice high contrast look because there's no obstructions that are scattering light inside the optical tube. Um, they can be used for low power and high power viewing, which is very nice. It's a very multi-role uh, setup. Uh, real quick, uh, that being said, um, achromatic refractors. Uh, if you're really into solar observing, like if you want to do hydrogen alpha viewing with like a day star filter, or if you want to mount some kind of uh, narrow band uh, filter up on the front, an acromat is all that you need. Um, because you're isolating one wavelength of light, it doesn't matter if there's color correction. So um, having an acromat can be very effective if you're looking to do solar observations with the correct filters. Um, so that can be something that an acromat is actually very good for because you don't need the extra expense of the ED elements when you're doing uh, narrow band solar work like uh, hydrogen alpha. So something to look into. Um, the, most refractors can be easily adapted to photographic use because the camera mounts on the back. Um, you can easily balance everything on the mount. Um, Generally, some of the telescopes that are designed for imaging will have a matched corrector um, and that'll have the ability to illuminate the sensors um, on a variety of sizes, especially nowadays because there's so many larger sensors that are becoming more affordable. Um, we're pushing up to that uh, affordable full frame cameras that are starting to come out. So more people are going to want to put bigger and bigger sensors on the telescopes. Refractors can be really easy to adapt for things like that as opposed to maybe some other optical designs. Uh, visual, they're, they're obviously excellent for visual work because they're giving you that contrast, especially on the uh, lunar and planetary observations. Um, they can be good for very wide field of view uh, with a nice low power uh, eyepiece, but you can actually zoom in quite a bit. Um, so they're very, very flexible. That's what's very nice about refractors to um, start with. Uh, but disadvantages, every telescope's going to have its pluses and minuses. You're never going to have the perfect telescope. Um, that's why all of us have a garage full of 14 different telescopes because we can't pick one. Um, uh, they can be long and bulky on larger uh, telescopes, like the C6R that I mentioned earlier uh, from Celestron. It's a beautiful telescope, but that tube is about four feet long. So it's big. You have to take that into consideration. Um, there's nothing you can really do about it. Um, even like our Evo Star 150, it's a long telescope. You have to think about it when you're getting up to a large refractor, um, kind of like transporting a big soda straw. Um, when I had that big Mead 7 inch refractor, that was almost six feet long with the dew shield. And luckily the vehicle that I'm driving has the ability to fit that barely, but I, um, I was able to accommodate that. But when you're getting a large refractor, you want to consider how you're going to transport it. It may not be heavy, but big. Uh, large mounts uh, are going to be needed when you need uh, larger refractors. Yeah. Um, but what I mean by that, and this actually comes up quite a bit, is let's say like the EQ6R back here. This can hold 45, 44 pounds worth of uh, telescope. Um, you could put a, a six inch triplet on that and use it. It would move it around, it would point it. The problem with refractors though that you have to take into consideration is that the tubes are long. You have to worry about the moment arm and the amount of torque that it's gonna take to spin that tube across the sky. Um, some designs like a Schmidt-Cassegrain, they're more stubby. 
and the center portion of the weight is over the mount more. A refractor being really long, especially when you get to five, six inch telescopes, um, that weight is offset quite a bit from the center balance point. So you're gonna need torque to uh, accommodate for that. So refractors can be demanding on, larger refractors can be demanding on mounts um, just because of the moment arm that needs to move. Now, optically, they can suffer from chromatic aberration. If you're using an acromat, um, obviously you can get a longer focal length one. Um, you don't see too many longer focal length stuff anymore. Um, I've had people come up to us asking us when we're going to make a 6-inch F12. We're not. Um, there's just no demand for it on our market. But you do have companies like D&G um, Optical. They are really well known for making long focus, large aperture acromats. But again, they're going to be long. They're going to be big. They kind of become more specialty um, at that point. Um, so they can suffer from chromatic aberration. There are ways around it, but you're paying for it at some point. Um, uh, higher end models like the apochromats uh, do use more exotic glass so like the expense is going to be more expensive um, of buying one and they obviously can be limited on aperture sizes so um, up to 150 millimeter is the most logical or six inch um, once you go beyond that you're getting really should be an observatory um, or you're going to get really tired of it um, they're obviously limited on deep sky work because of their limited aperture. It's still a six inch telescope. Um, very nice six inch telescope, but it's still a six inch. So that's, that's pretty much it for the, this week's topic. It's amazing how fast we blow through an hour. Um, next week we're talking about setting up your imaging train. Um, we get a lot of questions on, I want to put a filter wheel. I want to put a camera. I want to put an off axis guider, blah, 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 all this stuff. Well, we're going to show you how to kind of how to lay out your imaging train and how to think about that. And hopefully that's useful for some people. Um, so join us next week, 10 a.m. Um, again, right here at the Skywatcher uh, USA YouTube channel. Um, uh, after that, we're going to be talking about Evo Star series, lots of refractors. And at the end of the week, or I'm sorry, end of the month, our special guest speaker is Michael Hattie from Starlight Express. Uh, CCD cameras. Uh, so we're going to take a look at that. So if you have questions, now is the time to open up the floodgates and run rampant with them. I'll be happy to answer what I can. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see what we've got here. Uh, Jeff Lucas, astrophotographer, does Skywatcher use light pollution coatings on the glasses? We, so I guess you could technically coat a lens with uh, light pollution uh, coatings like a filter downfall of that is uh, you actually have to be careful um, this actually comes up a lot on uh, mirrors some coatings actually the way they adhere to glass um, eventually your coating is going to fade and has to be recoded um, a lot of the coatings that we use are hard coatings, so it's not going to happen. But if for whatever reason you put a specialty coating, like a light pollution filter coating on there, um, depending on how that coating is done and applied, um, if you ever need to get rid of coatings on certain optics, sometimes you have to grind them off of the glass and uh, refigure the whole thing. So. Um, I'm not saying that's what's done on all light pollution uh, coatings. I don't know as much about those particular filters and the actual coating methods. Um, but all of the Skywatcher refractors are fully multi-coated to provide the best light transmission and uh, anti-reflections uh, coatings so that you're not getting weird glare. Um, so if you want to use light pollution, just get a light pollution filter and chuck it in the imaging system. It's a lot easier to use that. Um, then coating a whole lens in that thing. It's too specialized and limits the telescope. Let's see. Donnie, I read that the Esprit 120 ED triplet comes with a two element field flattener. Is this something that is built into the scope or is this a separate item? Um, so you need to check with your local distributor. 
Um, certain distributors around the world uh, sell the Esprits in different formats. Some of them include the field flattener. Others don't include it. It's not built in. You have to thread it on the back. Um, I thought I had one. in the disaster I call a desk. Um, but, yeah. So here in Skywatcher in North America, we include the field flatteners with all the Esprits. They're matched field, they're not reducers, they're just field flatteners. Um, we include that with the telescope that's included in the price. Um, but yes, if you're looking at other divisions of Skywatcher around the world, you'll have to see how they sell it. Some of them sell those optionally. Um, we sell it included. Um, so take a look at that. But yes, if you are here within the U.S. and Canada, any Esprit is going to come with the matched uh, two-element field flattener with it, as well as all the spacers to mount uh, a DSLR um, from there. If you have any other questions on that, you can always email us too. Uh, Christopher, wish you did a video on GTI setup like polar alignment. Uh, we can take a look at that. I will do a caveat on that, that the AZ GTI is not really intended for equatorial use. It just happens to be able to use one. So, um, I don't know that we'd cover the EQ version because it's not really intended for imaging purposes and it opens up a huge can of worms, um, as far as expectations go. So, uh, but we'll take a look at doing something on the AZ GTI. Um, we do have some cool stuff in the works, though, along those lines. I can't tell you yet, um, but just keep an eye on stuff that's coming. Uh, Jeff, have you experienced using a bot or semi apo Oh, this was for uh, something else. But anyway, I will go with that, too. Jeff, have you experienced using a bot or semi uh semi apo filter on either your Acromats or ED Acromats? So, personally, um, if you do have an Acromat, getting one of those uh, fringe killers or like the Botter Moon and Sky Glow, um, that's a very minimal investment that you can actually use uh, on your Acromatic Refractor to help get better uh, color correction or color corrected images uh, for visual work on uh, the planets and stuff like that they don't cost that much so if you do have an acromat it might be a worthy investment to pick one of those up i think there may be a hundred bucks or something like that depending on if you're doing inch and a quarter or two inch and give it a shot you might be amazed at how that will expand uh that capability um so we'll uh if you do have a if you do have a nice acromat you really like it you want to expand the capabilities of it using a, a filter to mitigate the, the chromatic aberration would probably be worthwhile to get it's, it's cheap it's something you can try out we always have new mounts coming out uh chris um there's stuff i can't talk about uh yet um there is a higher end mount than the gti much larger mount coming out um but there's some other stuff that no one knows about yet, so you just have to wait and see because they're not quite ready yet. When they are ready, we'll do a whole video on all the cool stuff that's coming out. Um, I've got at least three or four prototypes that you guys can't see here, so we're, we're really, really busy right now with all kinds of stuff. So despite the end of the world, we're still doing stuff. Uh, Jeff, what accessories do you think are best for use with refractors? Uh, APOs. Um... If you're just talking visual, um, a nice diagonal, sorry, a nice diagonal is something that's good to have, a nice dielectric diagonal to give you the most light throughput. Um, and then a really nice set of eyepieces are going to be um, nice to have. If you're investing a bunch of money in your telescope, the, the weakest link in your telescope system is going to be whatever your bottleneck is going to be. So if you have a nice lens up at the front, you're going to want to accessorize that with nice uh, diagonals and nice eyepieces because your telescope's only as good as the uh, weakest link on the system. So um, yeah, nice diagonal um, and then a good set of eyepieces to back that diagonal up, what I would go with. Uh, if you have a doublet, however, um, 
what I find a lot of customers like to do if you're willing to spend the money on them is the Botter uh, Prism, 90 degree prism, not a 45 degree prism. I find a lot of people really like using prisms instead of diagonals on doublets because they actually find out that uh, the color correction can be improved using a prism. So if you have one of our doublets or anybody's doublet for that matter, uh, take a look at the Botter prisms. They can be a little spendy, uh, but from what I understand, I've only used them very uh, loosely, but I have some friends of mine who use them. They rave about how the Botter prisms can be very nice um, at accelerating what the capabilities of an ED doublet can do and actually help with the color uh, fringing there's very minor color fringing on doublets, um, but still I, I find that people really do like using the Botter prisms um, if you have a doublet. Um, so something to something to think about. If you have a doublet, a nice prism can be a good addition um, to that. And of course, nice eyepieces. Um, having good eyepieces is something, if you're doing visual only, investing in a good set of eyepieces is something that you can really move forward with. Um, because as scopes come and go, your eyepieces are going to stay for the most part. Um, so having a nice set of eyepieces is something that's kind of worth investing in. Um, and then, of course, if you have an acromat, all those rules still apply. A uh, nice set of eyepieces, nice diagonals. Um, maybe look at one of those fringe killer filters. Um, there's a couple different, uh, or like a Botter Moon and Sky Glow. Uh, but there's different filters out there that can help uh, mitigate that color aberration. So that that that's not something you're going to use all the time but if you're doing the moon and planets it might be worth checking out um some filters to have in the accessory case to back up that big acromat refractor um, and then of course a good mount um if you're doing big refractors um you can have the best refractor in the world if it's sitting on a crappy mount or a mount that just can't handle it then that was a waste so uh, a good mount is the pinnacle of any good telescope system so those are kind of the things that i would uh check it out so um stuff like that is what i would probably recommend as far as accessories for your telescope um if you're doing that but yeah good eyepieces good diagonal solid mount um pretty much across the board for all uh refractors so that's about it for today. It's amazing how fast an hour blows by. Um, hopefully your skies are clear this weekend. The moon is going down. We've got Jupiter and Saturn and Mars coming up. Not too late in the evening right now. So it's a good time to get out and go view. Uh, Comet Neowise is still out there. You're going to need a telescope at this point. So give that a shot. Um, and then, yeah, next week we're talking about the uh, setting up your imaging train and how to accommodate and figure out back focus and all that. So we'll get into that. Um, if there's something I didn't answer or something pops up into your head, you can email us at support at skywatcherusa.com. Um, title it What's Up, and we'll, we'll try to get back to you on that. Um, if there's a topic you want us to cover or look into, you can do the same thing. Um, if you do like these videos and you want to know when we're doing them next, you can always subscribe to the YouTube channel. I know that's super YouTube, but we're on YouTube, so get over it. Um, so that's uh, something you can check out as well. Um, so other than that, that's pretty much it. I hope you all have a good, safe weekend and clear skies and go out and put some photons through that telescope um, if you've got it. And... Uh, thank you all for watching and we will see you guys next.